heat before those dumb ice men get here. Yesterday they put the ice in the radio. What'd you roll over in your sleep for? Where's that other chucklehead? Welcome to Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC Show. We will see you in uh, about 45 seconds or so. Make sure that you are subscribing to our channels, our LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, turn on notifications, and we are very excited to be here with you. It's almost time, about 30 more seconds. Make sure to grab your notebook and pen so you can jot down notes along the way because at the end of the show, you could have an opportunity to ask our guests questions so we can dive a little deeper into these topics. And here we go. Welcome to Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC Show. Thank you all for joining Did You Know the ESCO HVAC Show brought to you by the ESCO Institute. My name is Clifton Beck and we've been spending a lot of time talking about changes in our industry, new regulations, implementation of new equipment and refrigerants. And we want to dive a little bit into some of the technology that we're going to be seeing over this you know, next couple weeks, months, years the evolution of our HVAC industry. And we're grateful to have guests of the industry joining us. So we have Christian Valoria, Jamie Kono, both building science engineers from PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And we're gonna discuss some of the incentives and the opportunities that are coming to us through the DOE, through things like the Inflation Reduction Act. So what are we talking about with the Inflation Reduction Act? Many people are unaware of how important, how impactful this is to the world and to the industry. Well, it is one piece of legislation that has been signed that is going to bring about a, um, a significant amount of investment into change in the way that we utilize energy. And this is a piece of a worldwide effort to reduce our total CO2 emissions. Right, So we're all playing a part in the global reduction of greenhouse gases. Now, we are going to see some transitions in our industry due to this. It's been inevitable. Anyone who has really been around the automotive industry has seen that it's been happening there for decades. When we started the initiative to reduce CO2 emissions in the automotive industry, it was pretty drastic, pretty quick, and we are continuing to make changes in increasing the efficiency of our automobiles so that we can decrease the CO2 emissions. Now, what about the HVAC industry? Well, we talked about this a few months ago. We have been making some changes in our SEER requirements, and we've gained a little bit of uh, momentum on that, but not as significant as it could be. Well, when we look back at what happened with the automotive industry, we took out things like carburetors and points ignition systems and timing chain, you know, chain driven timing systems to go with things like fuel injection, electronic ignitions and variable valve timing, right? Starting to get variable capacity out of our systems, our pieces of equipment. Well, when we talk about HVAC, we're going to start seeing some similar things in the HVAC industry. A lot of us have already noticed those. We've been moving away from things like fixed orifice pistons and contactors and single speed motors, going with things like thermostatic expansion valves and electronic expansion valves that utilize control boards and variable capacity compressors, right? Inverter driven systems. So we're gonna spend some time today looking at how these inverter systems are bringing the efficiency to our industry and how things like the Inflation Reduction Act are going to make it a little bit easier for us to look at these transitions because we're going to see a lot more heat pumps and especially cold climate heat pump technology. So we need to be prepared for that. And we can now talk about 
how we can make that a little easier on the budget, a little softer cushion in the wallet. So Jamie and Christian, we thank you for joining us and let's talk a little bit about what the DOE is doing for us through the Inflation Reduction Act. Sounds great. Uh, thanks, Clifton. Yeah, so I wanted to get started by just talking about one of the the newest actual incentives that's out Very right new. now. In uh, this was just announced by the Energy Energy .gov earlier in December, right. and so this is a two thousand up to two thousand dollar tax credit for heat pumps also includes uh, heat pump water heaters. Uh, so we'll cover 30% of the cost up to $2,000. And yeah, it's something that's available right now. It's through the Inflation Reduction Act and yeah, can be can be used right at the moment. So up until now, like through 2022, we did have some incentives. We had a $300 incentive for heat pumps, for geothermal heat pump installations heat pump water heaters, but now we're talking about a 30%, up to 30% of the cost of installation up to $2,000 per year. Uh, so a pretty significant change in the way that we're going to be applying tax credits towards our HVAC equipment. Yeah. And also, you know, this, this table, we've, we've copied it from the DOE, but it's a, it's also just for the heat pump side of things, but there's also a lot of other efficiency rebates available for insulation, for windows, upgrading your electrical panel, all of those kind of things, because uh, we know that it's really important to look at a home holistically when you're doing these kind of retrofits. And if you do enough weatherizing or efficiency improvements, now you don't need to put as, as large of a system in. So very, very helpful all around. And that's something that a lot of our contractors are going to have to look at going forward is, you know, we've had a lot of inefficient systems for decades and we're starting to understand the importance of doing, you know, package analysis, looking at the envelope of a structure to see what we can do to make improvements for that, right? We're starting to see a lot more, you know, duct and envelope testing, blower door testing. We're starting to see the demand for efficiencies. We now have states and jurisdictions that are requiring blower door testing on new constructions to validate how tight the system is and gives us the opportunity to potentially reduce the, the BTU load that is on the structure. So the capacity of the structure. So if we look at that and we start with, okay, what is our first steps? Are we just replacing a piece of equipment or can we look at all of the options that we have? I highly recommend doing energy audits on our structure. We had no incentives up until now to do energy audits, but now we're looking at a 30% of the cost up to $150 to do a home energy audit to be able to assess are we in a position where we can look at other home improvements? Because now if we're looking at a heat pump, especially a cold climate heat pump, what else can we add? So if we start with a home audit, now we've got incentives to be able to put towards a home audit. And if we look at that home audit and we assess that, hey, maybe our windows and doors aren't up to snuff. We've had some incentives in the past, exterior doors, we could do up to 10% of the cost. Now we're talking about up to 30% of the cost for our doors to up to $250 a piece. We've got windows that now has a 30% of the cost up to $600. We have insulation materials that went from a 10% rebate now into a 30% rebate. We have electric water heating solutions, a variety of different things to help increase the envelope of the structure, all being brought through as tax incentives from the DOE. As an HVAC contractor, that is a lot of opportunity when we're looking at a house. Because in the past, we have been HVAC contractors and HVAC technicians. Well, now the responsibility is really going to start falling on us to analyze a home a little bit more. We may not want to get into home energy audits, but it's a great recommendation to be able to bring one in to analyze a structure to see if we can reduce the capacity of our system. In the yeah, past, agreed. Clifton, I would say that, again, when you get into the colder climates where fossil fuels are used, such as propane or natural gas, we could overcome certain deficiencies in the envelope because there was such a high temperature difference between the outdoor air and the indoor air. I mean, that gas furnace is putting out some, some really RBTs. high temperatures, right? And <clears throat> if we're going to have success moving forward, transitioning into, again, cold climate heat pumps, one of those paths to success of that unit in that structure is going to be to look at the entirety of the structure, the envelope, the duct, those sorts of things, again, to ensure that 
this system, one, we can downsize it a little bit, and two, it's going to be successful in this situation. The homeowner is going to have a good right. experience. Yeah, because what if we had never had our our entire electrical system sized for doing electrical heating capacities? What if we were only gas? And now we're starting to look at a home and go, wow, maybe we need to reanalyze to see, because I maybe I really want to go with a cold climate heat pump. And we've been talking about it for a while. Now we've got incentives. You know, the old system is really starting to wear out. It's time to think about what we can do. Well, if we have to have any kind of upgrades into our electrical service, we didn't have anything before. Now we've got a 30% of the cost up to $600 for electrical panel upgrades. So we're looking at the entire structure and adding a lot of funds available for homeowners to do improvements on their residence. We can also identify any deficiencies in the structure that may have been hidden or not as obvious by having that, that gas furnace there. Exactly. Because in the Where past, we're wasting it's energy, just ran. Right? Yeah. Right. You, it kept up, but how much energy were we wasting? Yes. And, Ooh. you know, especially on our older homes, they were natural drafted systems and have poor ventilation, poor windows, poor doors. Now we can really make an impact to our total CO2 emissions by improving our structure. And we've got incentives for doing that. And there's a comfort aspect to that as well. Mm, you know, but sure, you can crank your gas furnace to really hot, but if there's a draft coming in the windows your you know your feet are still going to be cold by the windows exactly well, there's such a difference in temperature between the time the furnace turns off and the time it turns back on again there's just this huge swing where you don't you, there's that uncomfortable like you Our said glide comfort gets really huge, wide right? i'll bring one one thing up about comfort as well because part of my work involves windows yeah so if you have a single pane window and you're putting in a, an air conditioning system to you know condition the space Say, for instance, it's in the summer, you have sun outside, it's in the afternoon, 72 degrees outside, you want it to be 72 degrees on your in your home. If you have a poor performing window, you're still going to be uncomfortable, even if you're blasting cold air into that room. So, uh, you know, as, as an HVAC contractor, if you're really, you know, what, what are you actually providing? It's comfort. Comfort. So you, you do want to really pay, pay attention to the building shell when you're thinking about uh, what you want to do for your customer. And even for the contractor, we've seen a change from HVAC sales into a new classification of salespeople that are comfort consultants. So we're seeing a lot more comfort consultants in the industry. And you're right. It's there to analyze what the structure is. Let's look at the total shell. Let's see if there are other things that can be improved so that when we leave, you have a more comfortable home. So really glad to see that we have so many things changing for incentives for basically our contractors. All right, anything we yeah, wanna touch on this one before we move on to the next slide? I did real quickly wanted to point out, um, you know, other energy efficiency upgrades. Clifton, you mentioned, you know, potentially switching from a gas fired system to an electric heat system. And, you know, the circuitry might not be enough, the, the service right. might not be like that. So that's specifically why they have in here, you know, electrical, electric panel or circuit upgrades for new electric equipment. I'm kind of thinking about that decarbonization goal, switching from, you know, potentially switching from gas or oil to electric or heat pump systems. Yeah. Now, we've yeah. seen a lot of homes that were built with the 60 amp service panels, you know, back in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, into the early 80s that really weren't designed for an electrification movement because of the cost of utilities at the time. You know, where natural gas on 60% efficient furnaces was the primary heating source. And we're not going to be able to justify that going forward. We're going to have to improve the efficiencies of our homes. And this is where we start. Very good. All right, well, let's look at how these incentives can develop and how we can add these incentives to really start bringing some big numbers into perspective. Yeah, so we talked about the incentive that's here right now. Um, there's another part of the Inflation Reduction Act that is still getting rolled out. It's the HERA, High Efficiency Electric Home Rebate Act. I believe mm. that's the the letters in the alphabet. Good job. There. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Did my, did my homework before this. So this is uh, going to be implemented by the states. It is a voluntary program, so it's possible that not every state will use it. But the, the idea behind this is this will provide point of sale rebates on various electrification equipment, including heat pumps, including electrical upgrades. You see there's $4,000, up to $4,000 
rebate for breaker boxes, 2,500 for electric wiring, plus 8,000 for a heat pump, all up yeah. to a max of $14,000. And I, I really, I really love this program and I hope that it is very successful because it's not a tax credit. It's a rebate. So up front? yeah, so you don't have to shell out all that money for the system, then wait to get it back when you file your taxes the following year. It's, it's available right then. And not, not only that, but it's targeted towards average and lower income households, which sure. means that, you know, you, it's going to be that much more accessible to people. And hopefully will mean that we get not only do I think it's great because I want, I want everyone to have heat pumps, but especially the people that are going to benefit from the most. Like, the most. We don't want this to be like brag about your Tesla kind of sure. situation. Yeah. We want this to be, you know, everyone's everyone's got it. Well, we think about the most vulnerable homes that we have. Those are going to be the ones that are in that less than 80% median income. Now, when this was originally proposed, this was at a 50% median income, which is a very, very low number. That has been up to, so now we're talking, you know, less than 80% of the median income. That opens up a lot of homes to this, a lot of homes that are very inefficient right now. And so if we are in that less than 80% of the median income for the area, which is different across the country. You have to know what it is for your location. Just do a quick Google for median income, your area for the year. It'll tell you what that is. I know what it is in my area uh, and it's a pretty decent number. So a lot of people would qualify for that, which means that's a 100% upfront discount on $8,000 on heat pump system, $1,750 on a heat pump water heater, which are really coming into play, $840 for electric stove and cooktop, which is a really cool incentive, $840 for a heat pump clothes dryer, $4,000 for a breaker box replacement, $2,500 for electrical wiring upgrades, and $1,600 for different weatherization, including insulations, ventilation. That is a big, big opportunity for folks to increase the comfort of their home. And these are in conjunction with the actual tax incentives as well. Is that correct? Ooh, I don't know. I My guess is that they're not, like you can't claim, you couldn't claim both. Sure. Okay. Um, now, do we have an anticipated rollout for this rebate level? Uh, so I don't know. And I should, I should preference. So I don't have the inside scoop here, unfortunately. I do sure. have the time and the fortitude to dig through things, which is why... These slides came out with with help from Christian. So yeah, I am not sure it's and it's it's probably going to be different for every state because these will be implemented through the the state energy offices. Awesome. So it's it's really a wait and see sort of thing. I'll I'll keep I'll keep you in the loop, Clifton. Yeah, and definitely. You all can uh, post on LinkedIn and other places. Yeah, because uh, these are very least. important for our contractors to be able to Remember look at that systems. Name. H e e h r a, right? Yeah, Mira. Use the Google, right? Well, because yeah. we're going to see a lot of changes in equipment pricing now that we're moving into the SEER two requirements, which started for our manufacturers for January first. So four days ago, we started new equipment requirements, and so we're going to probably, most definitely, see some increases of the cost of equipment going into 2023. So this is an opportunity to bring really good incentives for our customers. Agreed. Cool. All right. So let's look at some other options that we have. Even besides these, since we don't know exactly when that's rolling out, what other opportunities do we have rolling out across the country that are important things to know for our contractors? So one program is the New York State Heat Pump Program. I heard about this. It uh, gives quite generous incentives for whole home electrification. So it's it's been a big push in New York because they just, in general, have been pushing really hard on decarbonization for a while. Absolutely. Already cutting off gas connections and looking at electrification on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. And and I should add, so, so New York State's program is very, very much aggressive towards the whole home electrification, getting rid of the old fossil fuel systems. That is not necessarily required for you to work on kind of electrification goals. You know, it, for example, I've worked with, uh, talked with a contractor in Minneapolis who does a lot of advocacy for heat pumps. He hasn't installed any all electric heat pumps. He's only done dual fuel sure. systems. 
because that's the most cost effective for his customers. And it, his tagline, I think, is never install an air conditioner again. Like if you're going to put in AC, you, you better put in a heat pump as well because you're just yep. leaving money on the table. Absolutely. Don't. I mean, if you look at that, if you're just replacing an AC on a system versus a heat pump, which is marginally more expensive, those are big, big tax breaks. Yeah. 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 And with the, with the incentives, yeah, it's just a, it's a great, a great setup. So tell me a little bit about these new requirements in Washington, because I've seen and heard a little bit about this, but I really haven't dove very deep into it. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and Christian, if, if you've got more to add, definitely pipe in. I believe Washington State has just recently passed passed a law that requires all new construction to be built with air source heat pump or some kind of heat pump. And this is really pretty groundbreaking. You think of it's Washington big. State, you think of Seattle, which mm -hmm. is a little more, well, <laughs> unless you saw them in the news, uh, typically, you know, a little more of a mild climate where it doesn't get sure. overly sure. cold in the winter. But actually, Washington State is uh, the whole, the eastern two thirds of the state. It's really cold. I just moved there from Atlanta, so mm -hmm. I I experience it. I know it. <laughs> sure, absolutely. And so these cold climate heat pumps are gonna be really critical for, for rolling out. Uh, so we're talking about there. new construction residential. Just, yeah, just new construction residential. And commercial as well, I believe. Okay, okay. Um, I, th I think commercial was first and then in November uh, they rolled out this new residential construction. Okay, yeah. very interesting. And, and, the, and yeah, so I bought a home in in Eastern Washington over the summer, and it has a two year old. Uh, it was built two years ago, and it's got a two year old condensing gas furnace in it. And I I feel like a traitor to the cause because they go right. out and I talk to people about heat pumps, and I got a gas furnace in my in my home. But yeah, I want I'm I'm excited because people aren't going to have to deal with that problem. <laughs> right. Going forward, yeah. And Washington has made a, a pretty pretty hard stance on uh, electrification and degassing on new construction. So very interesting to see that we're adapting that so quickly. Well, what about utilities? What else are we seeing in the utility sector? So I won't I won't list them all, but there there's a lot of utility rebates out there already for heat pumps. It varies greatly depending on the area or the restrictions. But yeah, a lot of a lot of incentives for heat pumps across the board. So we need to just reach out to our local utilities to check on heat pump incentives. Mm -hmm. And and what I wanted to get with this whole list is that this is kind of, this is the future. Like yeah. heat, heat pumps are are rolling out. Uh, sometimes there's a carrot dangling, and sometimes like in the state of Washington, that it's more of a stick kind of situation because yeah. uh, it's a requirement. Requirement. Um, yeah, you're being yeah, prodded but, in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that, you know, the, yeah, that's what's happening. And yeah, like, so I, I made this slide to be a little cheesy <laughs> um, because, you know, HVAC technicians, HVAC educators play a critical role in, in this rollout. I know when I was little, my, I grew up as an energy efficiency buff. And when I was little, I remember hearing that my grandma would not put fluorescent light bulbs in her house because when they first came out, she was like, I'm going to save energy. It's going to be great. Put them in. They were awful because yeah. the lighting quality was poor. We, we don't want to do grandma's light bulbs for our heat pump rollout. Like, sure. we, you know, heat it pumps are not. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we can do it. Like the technology is there. Everything is there. It's a matter of cool climate heat pumps and, and, you know, well-performing heat pumps require a little extra attention and as the market shifts that will require you know additional additional training supplement to existing training and yeah it's just such an important piece of this of this puzzle as you really mentioned <clears throat> there's a carrot that they're dangling again in the form of rebates or you know upfront cost cutting things but we also have some of the stateside you know banning in a lot of cities, we've seen natural gas from oh, being yes. installed, forcing us exactly. to go this way. So one way or another, this is coming out and we need to ensure that it's going to be successful in its rollout. We can't have it stumble out the gate. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because we hear a lot from different departments of our federal government. And, you know, when when we look at the importance of electrification, the importance of reducing our carbon emissions, it's something that we have to do. And to be able to do that successfully, we're going to have to unite as an industry. We keep talking about this village of the HVAC industry, how there's not just one area of of the industry that can educate enough. We all have to come together and be able to educate these changes and bring awareness to them because it's going to bring new skills. It's going to bring new education. It's going to change the curriculum that we use in our institutions to be able to prepare technicians for working on this technology. It's not like it's exactly new technology. We've been working with cold climate technologies for a decade or more in these low ambient conditions. Now, we did have an implementation of cold climate, of heat pump technology that really uh, put some sour concepts when we introduced those back in the 1970s. We've really been making them since the 1950s, but in the 1970s and 1980s, we started utilizing heat pump technology a little bit more often. And it was a big change going from, got to think back then, we were talking 60% efficient gas furnaces that had very high heat output, high temperature rise. So when we went to heat pump technology, yes, it was more efficient, but it may not have been as comfortable. And so that's where we come into that comfort advisory, where we're actually educating people on how to make homes and structures more comfortable to prepare them for heat pumps. So that transition of heat heat pump technology has really changed a lot in this last 10 years, particularly. Yeah, exactly. Better late than never. We are definitely needing the technology. So what we've seen is we've seen heat pumps be able to produce heat at lower temperatures. A lot of that has to do with inverter technology, which we didn't have when we introduced heat pumps. We had single stage compressors with single and two or three speed fan motors. We moved air. We weren't able to manipulate the boiling point of the refrigerant the way that we do today. So we now have heat pumps that have very high heat capabilities at low ambient temperatures. When we look at our earlier generations of heat pumps, the R22, eight sear heat pumps that really didn't do us much any good below 40 degrees ambient. Well, we don't have that technology. We have a significant increase in technology and we have the ability to look at system performance and do installations and do service based on how well these systems can perform. So there's a lot of data that we can utilize that we didn't do when we were working on our earlier generations of heat pumps. So how is that changing? How are we looking at installation and commissioning of equipment a little bit differently? Yeah, so so thanks for that, Clifton. Well, just preface, I know that we've talked a lot about heat pump deployment, right? Deploy, deploy, deploy. They're here. Yeah, this is the way that we're going to reach our carbon goals. This is how we're going to mitigate climate change. And most of the world has already adapted it. It's not like we're doing something at the same pace as the rest of the world. You know, most of the rest of the world has inverterized over the last 20 years. We're just now catching up to them because we have these old antiquated ducted systems. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the technology has been here. We just haven't adapted it the way we were supposed to have. Yeah. Well, I think the I really agree with the de- de- deploy uh, mentality, right? These are these are the technology of the future that will get us yeah. to where our goals need to be. One of the caveats to that is that you can't have all this deployment without some proper training, without proper testing and commissioning. So there were some recent DOE reports that found that 70 to 90% of HVAC systems, residential HVAC systems came or had an energy wasting fault introduced to them during the time of installation. Then you can go back to the the last slide just real quick. Yeah. Um, So 70 to 90% of HVAC systems, of residential HVAC systems. It's pretty high. uh, it's, it's, (laughs) It's very high, right? And then on top of that, there was a recent report by a modeling study by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that mm-hmm. found that because of these energy wasting faults and, and faults introduced during the installation of central air conditioners and air source heat pumps, compared to those systems, if they're installed correctly, we're wasting 9% of energy a year. Just in and- installation and commissioning, just set up alone. Just and just for residential air source heat pumps and central air conditioning. I was going to wow. say because commercially they do a more robust commissioning of that equipment. It's a lot right. more expensive. It has a lot more draw baseline the, data. Yeah, and now we're we're having to see this trickle into the to the residential side. The technology is there. It's just that we yeah. have to kind of bring it on over. Yeah, and that's I mean you bring up a really good point, right? That I. I got my start on the uh, commercial side. I was doing HVAC design for a design build firm in the Bay Area. 
and you know they always had tab reports they always had startup and commissioning yeah, absolutely. Reports and whatnot. so if you're going to do that for a large building why aren't you going to do that for a home if i'm paying you know upwards of 10 or twenty thousand dollars for an hvac system and it's a system that's supposed to last 20 years right i want to make sure that that system was you know properly installed when you go and the technology is you know, there to do it it absolutely is oh, here yeah. oh yeah and you know when you go when you go to buy a car too, you know how much are you spending somewhere around? I don't know. We we don't need to get the numbers. Sure. It, it gets pretty high now. But each of those cars are tested when they leave the factory. Absolutely. To make sure that they are properly built. So we need to do the same thing while we're in the field creating these HVAC systems. And and as you mentioned, Jason, like the technology is already there. So the thing that I'm working on for the Department of Energy, it's called the Smart Tools for Efficient HVAC Performance Campaign. I know it's it's a lot, it's a mouthful. We like to create acronyms wherever we go. Uh, we, yeah. call it, <laughs> we call it the STEP campaign for short. Yeah, no, I like uh, it. And essentially what we're trying to do is encourage the use among contractors and technicians of these smart diagnostic tools. So where you're doing a holistic system testing, we're testing char not only the charge of your refrigerant, but you're also doing some airside testing as well, and bring those all into, you know, these diagnostic apps that can really perform those those tests for you, um, and make it really easy to, you know, Jamie mentioned some utilities that offer incentives for heat pumps. Sure. And those utilities have, you know, what they call quality installation. They got their requirements. Yeah. Some of those programs do use these types of tools. And the, yep. the reason why they've moved to these types of tools was because the antiquated processes of filling out forms with all of the data that you're collecting one by one. One by one by one yeah. with a mechanical and, device. Yeah. It was great. And they so. can be pencil whipped as well. They can be filled out to have it whatever say whatever yeah. you want it to say. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, utilities are starting to use these tools to really make that process as speedy as it, as, as it can be and really Why wouldn't they absolutely yeah. if i'm giving you money for a high performance system you need to validate to me that it is a high performance system that's mm -hmm. all I, if i was it's just a business practice that i would follow through and i think we're going to see a lot more of these expectations and requirements going forward because you got to think about this installation and commissioning is not new either Every furnace, AC, and heat pump installation manual that you have ever opened or not opened, and the very back of it has installation and commissioning tablet. It has all the data that we're supposed to re record on startup and commissioning of any piece of HVAC equipment. We typically are not doing that because it's not been required. So those are the things is that we should see changes going forward. So I think smart diagnostic tools are a big, big plus in our industry. I'll point out too that a lot of those smart diagnostic tools that we're seeing on the hit the market too, when we talk about the variance or the <clears throat> the fluctuation of the readings that we're getting when we get into some of these smarter tools, the tolerances are a lot lower, the variances are a lot lower, so they're a lot more yeah. accurate than some of the more mechanical things that we've had uh, in the past. Yes. I mean, we think back about the days that Jason and I got into, you know, installation commissioning. We had mechanical gauges and we might have had some digital temperature probes and we had some manometers or we had a magna helic and you got pretty close on well, your airflow and you got pretty yeah. close on your refrigerant charge and then off you go. Today's systems are very critically charged and even just a couple of ounces can significantly change the performance of the system. It was actually brought up by one of our, one of our joiners that, you know, they were very one of the, the statements was commissioning is super important with the last winter storm in upstate new york I was worried that the heat pumps would fail because of these reasons they did survive a lot of them did well but when we get into those lower temperatures those critical um, temperatures and operating conditions the critical charge is absolutely important and the only way to do that is to validate it properly during installation and during servicing absolutely so cool. Step program. I'll make sure we put a link to that in the video. So we've got a reference of how to get there faster and encourage people to dive into that a little bit deeper. Awesome. Thanks, Clifton. Yeah. 
so now we wanted to so we we've given you the the spiel <laughs> on some of the kind of the big picture things we think are important about incentives about heat pump rollouts and it, we you know we could talk for for the next 10 hours on on everything else but we wanted to share with you some resources that are available to help with either training or as as a technician for uh, climbing selection. systems. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this this first one I've got here is the NEEP Cold Climate Heat Pump Database. NEEP. Oh boy, that's the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership. Is that right? Go. Yep. Another good um, one. Mm -hmm. And yeah. There's all then then and then there's me. Uh, I think I got those two swapped a bunch. Uh, anyway, but this database by NEEP is a really great resource. They yeah. show the they have a, a ton of heat pump units with performance specs at five degrees heating specs at five degrees outdoor temperature. So expanded beyond the AHRA catalog so that you can get get a feel for the cold climate performance of heat pumps without having to go track down the extended manufacturer data. We don't, that's a big lift. They've got hundreds sure. of, of data points in here. This is, this is one example here with a Fujitsu unit. I just pulled it off of um, their website and it, yeah, it, it shows the, the specific unit, the paired outdoor indoor unit, and rated and maximum cooling and heating capacities. For this one, for example, it's got the normal AHRI outdoor temperatures of 47 degrees and 17 degrees, but it also shows that five degree heating point. A lot of other units, if they're rated for below five degrees, can the manufacturer submits this data to NEEP and so let's say it's rated at negative five or negative 15 or wow. negative 22 it'll they'll show. they'll submit that it'll show up it's a lot easier to find a mini split with that kind of rating right now right. but i i've yeah. seen yeah a good number of split split units that also have negative five and negative 15 ratings on there and it'll show the minimum rating the maximum rating as well as the cop on there which me being an energy buff, I, I'm mm -hmm. always excited to see yeah. that. I base um, everything on COP. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's such a good resource. Yeah, and that is really good expanded data that you can get very quickly. Because otherwise, to get expanded data, you're going to have to go back to the manufacturer. You're either going to have to go to the website, go to the actual model, break down into the specifications for it, into the extended data charts, if they're even there. Or you're going to have to get a manual for a piece of equipment. So now we can look at that expanded heating data, because that's something that we haven't looked at in design as much in the past. Because if we were looking at design of heating, we are looking at gas furnaces that could you know, supply a state steady supply of BTUs at any at the temperature. Rate you're losing it, right? Yeah, so we just did a heat load calculation and whatever the heating was, that's what we needed. Well, now when we start talking about variable capacity systems, we have to look at what is the capability of our equipment. Not all heat pumps are created equal. There's a variety of different applications. So when we start talking about the the expanded heating data, we need to make sure that we're looking at what's going to be needed for our area. Because if we're in an area that will hit minus 15 regularly and we have no backup heating source, we're going to have to look only at pieces of equipment that will allow the heating capacities at those minus, minus 15 temperatures, which in the past there have been very few, but they are out there. So that is now starting to develop. Our cold climate heat pump technology is really escalating and our options are going to be increasing on what equipment we can use. So super cool resource for looking at heating capabilities and different pieces of equipment. I just wanted to make a point before we got off of this slide <clears throat> that not only are we at, you know, having to educate technicians and contractors about, hey, these things are here, here's the incentives, here's how they work, but we also have to temper homeowner expectations You're right? Uh, as far as, you know, because they're used to that 120 or 130 degrees coming out of that vent, and you're not going to get that with a mini split or a, even a split system inverter. Uh, so you're going to have to temper their expectations. And the other thing that I, I, I bring up, again, looking at this, the slide is that when we used to size furnaces or when we size equipment, we size it at the rate we either lose heat or gain heat. But we never do anything about the rate at which we are losing heat or gaining heat. We just accept that as a as a fact and we size a unit based on that rate. Um, 
And again, what we're seeing here is that it has to be more of a, when we look at the rate that we're losing heat, there's a lot we can do about that. And then we can Absolutely. again scale that back. Not, don't just accept that as fact. Okay, we're losing X BTUs per hour at this temperature. Uh, let's size a unit to, to match that. Well, wait a minute. What can we do about losing all that heat per hour? Let's let's look at why we're let's, losing all of that heat. Let's reduce right. that. Right. And then this becomes doable. Yeah. I firmly believe that our HVAC technicians are going to develop into home auditing technicians in the process. And this is scary to a lot of people who have never been in that field, but it's really going to be required because what if you're doing a size up for a piece of equipment? The homeowner wants to go with a cold climate technology. You do the sizing and there's no piece of equipment that is capable of handling a comfortable thermal balance point for that structure. Well, now we're going to have to reduce our heat loss so that we can reduce the heat load that is needed, the heat supply off from our pieces of equipment. And that is a shift from the way that we have been working in the past. In the past, we just came to fix and off we went. Now we're gonna be looking at solutions, which is a really good place to be. Yeah, great slide, great resource. I'll put a link to that in there so we've got that as well. All right, so I guess this is, this is me again. So like I mentioned, the campaign that I'm working on is a step campaign. We're trying to get more contractors, more technicians to use these types of tools. We've written this case study on three different contractors that have adopted these tools into their businesses. I think that we, we probably need a few more case studies to really get that business value. Sure. Right. There, there are plenty of things other than just, you know, it, it helps with system performance, but also things like showing your customers, Hey, here's a report of all the data that I've collected. And here's it showing that you got an A plus for your system, you get a passing grade, you can, you know, you don't have to trust me, you can trust the data. Sure. Right? So there's that part. And then we've also heard a lot about this, you know, kind of great, great resignation of experienced HVAC techs. And we don't have, you know, kind of the new recruitment to backfill that these tools really offer a really interesting kind of new business model for new companies where, you know, instead of having all of your experienced HVAC techs having to do those, diag you know, the diagnostics, the troubleshooting, maintenance calls, now that tech can be back at the office in front of a computer, streaming the data from the probes and really helping and teaching these new techs on the job. Um, We're going to have a show on that here in a few weeks or so, talking about how that industry is changing and what that brings as a new perspective. So, oh yeah, yeah. it's really exciting. It's mm -hmm. really, really exciting. Well, and the uh, tools have changed us. I've gotten a chance to play with a lot of those tools, certain manufacturers I've, where we have the wireless technology, we have the apps that are doing things. You don't have to be on site. You can monitor even a lot of the thermostats today you know, where you can monitor from a distance what's going on in a structure, someone's home. Um, so this is, again, this is all coming. It's already here, yeah. uh, it, but it's about to go mainstream and we should be Absolutely. ready to embrace it. it. It makes our job a lot easier. Well, and think about what the tools have done for us just in general. You know, one of the comments that just came in, I use a thermal imaging camera to show homeowner where they are losing and gaining heat. It's super helpful. Uh, 30, 20 years, 10, five years ago as an HVAC technician, a thermal camera was like a really cool toy, right? Now we're implementing tools into the industry so that we can develop an entirely new business plan with our HVAC company. Um, there's just no end to where tools are going to be able to make us faster in our job. Back then, I would only see a thermal imager at a trade show. Yeah. That's the only time I ever got to pick one up and hold it back then. Now, right. um, I know 50 different techs that have them in their truck. Yeah, absolutely. I will, I will just put one real quick plug in that, you know, what, from what we've heard from contractors that don't use these tools yet is that they are looking for training. So yes. what I want to try to do with, with this campaign is, you know, reach out to trainers that are actually training on these tools for system performance and really serve as kind of a matchmaking service where it is. any contractor that wants to learn about these types of tools, yeah. here's the trainer. So that's what we're shooting for. It's going to take a little bit of time to build that network, but... Oh, it's growing. 
The, the demand is already there. The opportunities are there. So we're actually going to have FieldPiece on and we're going to dive into smart diagnostic tools from FieldPiece, how to use, implement ways that we can improve our own efficiency. So as technicians, we become faster at our job all because of tools and technology. So it's coming. It's it, it's growing faster than I think we would have originally anticipated. For sure. All right, I think we can move on to the next slide. I don't know if this was... Yes. Okay. So this is just another slide about these tools. Sure. For anyone who's not familiar, really what it is, is, you know, these wireless digital probes and sensors, it could also include a digital manifold uh, that connects to a diagnostic commissioning smartphone. Manometers, meters, reading wattage. I do it all with mine. That's a good way to bring the younger generation in by embracing this technology. They like gadgets. I'm, I'm telling, telling you. you. I had this conversation at the conference last year. I was talking to an educator. He's like, how do I get these young guys on the first day of school interested in HVAC? I said, you give them an iPad. You walk over to a piece of equipment that has every digital probe that you have. Give them the iPad and just let them stand there and watch it. And then put some cardboard over the fan. Change a few parameters. Let them see the wattage move. Let them see the refrigerant pressures move. And then start teaching them what that equipment was actually doing. Show them the technology first and... Boom. Now you've got it. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. And again, the younger generation is quick to embrace technology oh, love it. and they love gadgets. So again, if this is the future of the industry, we can draw in a lot of the younger generation by, again, embracing this technology. Exactly. And as instructors, I know Jason and I are right here with you. It's hard to teach something that you didn't grow up on. It's hard to teach something that you didn't use on your own. And that's why we're here. That's why we're in this village is to bring people in because we're all learning at the same time. Technology is moving faster than any of us want it to. But the reality is it's moving very fast and we have to keep up with it. And that's what we're doing. We're just talking about the changes in the industry. We're building the resources. We're getting the right people in the right place with the right information so we can all do this easier together. So I'm excited about it. I, I like change and I like technology. So this is fun for me. So, so this, yeah, this next one is uh, more oriented towards trainers, instructors who are doing this kind of heat pump or other emerging technology yeah. training. So this is the Building Science Education website. It's a Department of Energy site that is, our goal is to be a a centralized source of free open source materials that you can use for for training HVAC technicians or the the ultimate goal is for just overall building science education so people all through you know building managers technicians facility operators engineers architects etc everyone um, so this, this website has training materials and you can actually flip mm -hmm. to the next page here. It's got an example. So this is a very tiny view <laughs> of a bunch of the different new HVAC modules that we've added oriented towards heat pumps, cold climate heat pumps, retrofitting fossil fuel systems over to electric heat pump systems, uh, dual fuel systems, smart diagnostic tools. Uh, there's a lot of really great training materials. So this is this is meant for an instructor. You can download lecture notes. They, there's learning objectives, lecture notes, problem sets associated. Um, if you make an account and get signed up as a professor, you can get access to the answers to the problem sets. And there's also other resources like handouts, PowerPoint slides, video um, links, videos. Yeah. yeah. So it's a it's a great resource. I think I'm allowed to say that because I'm the main person that put it together. That's uh, right. <laughs> oh, I was in the classroom for 15 years, and I've had a chance to thumb through this. And I can tell yes. you, as from one educator to another, that there is a lot of really good material here. There's yeah. a lot of resources. It's well thought out. And if you're going to move forward with this in your program, that this is a, a great resource that you don't have to spend a lot of time on. It's it's already there. It's already prepared. And there's there's a lot of stuff put together categorically separated as you can see there from one instructor to another this is a great resource and it's not just on the heat pump technology as you can see there's things like duct leakage training one of the comments that just came in from keith thank you keith that is a really good point we talk about changes in technology and the controls and the equipment but what about the the old 
ductwork and what about the designs of the systems that is also having to change as we move forward we've already seen changes in the way we design equipment because of like things like the m1 m and m1 testing which is what's making the equipment move from sear to sear two you know our original expectations is that we had low external static pressure on our system designs and the reality is we don't that all ductwork is designed uh not as efficiently as it should, or it's had other things added. It's had different registers. It's had different uh, filters. It's, it's had things that's changed the airflow. So understanding duct work and understanding airflow in our systems is critical as well. So there are additional resources like the duct leakage testing and a variety of different applications out there to get better at understanding the envelope because the duct work is absolutely part of our envelope. I would say the duct work in most homes was designed and put in for a system that was designed 50 years ago. And we're hooking up a modern system from, say, 2023 today, uh, super high capacity, super high efficient to a duct system that was, again, designed for a system that was at best 60 percent efficient. Exactly. Not designed for the air filtration that we're utilizing today, not designed for secondary heat exchangers and not designed Airflow, for micro channel right. evaporators. And a lot of things have changed and it is about becoming better at what we do. If we think about what has changed as a, for a technician in the automotive industry, 20 years ago, you might have been an automotive technician that had a manual set of gauges and you had a voltmeter and a fuel pressure tester and you could work on a majority of the vehicles. You can't do that anymore, can you? You're using things like OBD2, three testers. We're analyzing systems with digital components and we're using laptops. those to pinpoint laptops, to pinpoint our problems. That's happening in our industry. It's happened in our commercial industrial for decades. It just didn't make its way into the residential the way it is now. So the expectation is that we are gonna to have to become better technicians, better contractors, and we're gonna to have to prepare ourselves for the equipment that is here, not just coming, is already here. And so now we're gonna see incentives for us to go with the technology. So what's gonna happen when the homeowners start utilizing the incentives? We're gonna be forced to install and work on these things. So that's what we're here for, is to prepare you. So I've got one more resource that I wanted to share with you all. This is, and I titled this as uh, Oriented Towards Everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is the Building America Solution Center, which is also a Department of Energy site. And I can't take credit for this one, but uh, it's also administered by folks here at PNNL. And it's a it's just a treasure trove of resources relating to building efficiency, to building performance, and to building resilience. And you know, when you're Googling random like home efficiency related things often the the top one or two results is actually from the building america from station here. center i've seen a lot of it popping up in my own searches so yeah there's a lot of data out there yeah and you can flip to the next page i've got an example of one of their guides so the the way it's structured they have these guides on different topics relating to buildings and so this is the one on traditional split heat split pumps mm -hmm. and it's got their little there you can see sort of in the middle there there's tabs so the mm -hmm. first one that's open right now is scope but there's a scope that talks about you know the a big picture of of what the system is there's a description which gets more detailed obviously you all don't need to read this one <laughs> But, you know, uh, things on what are the successful attributes sure. of, of a system, what do you have to consider in different climates, and some code-related things, um, some sales sales pitch. There's a lot of tools yep. there. Ton. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah, it, so it's great for, great for DIYers. It's great for home remodelers, good for HVAC technicians that are looking into HVAC efficiency type measures as well as overall home efficiency. So they've got a lot of really great resources on windows and air sealing and, you know. So it could be a resource for a homeowner. And that's what I see. And that's yeah. the part that most of us don't think about is, you know, in the, the past, owner, yeah, yeah we, we focus a lot on, you know, what are the options? We'll give some, you know, different options for equipment to the homeowner. But in the past, the homeowner has not really been as educated as what I anticipate they will be in these next couple of years. You know, this year, particularly this spring and summer, when the homeowner gets their first estimate on replacing equipment, they're going to step back and they're going to do some research to see what's happening in the industry. 
And these are going to be tools that will help with that because it's a it's a worldwide effort. We're starting to see a lot more advertisements for you know emissions reductions and greenhouse gases and how we can contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gases. As people start educating themselves, they're going to see the opportunity in using incentives and in using tools to do the research to find what works best for them and looking at all of the options that they have for you know utilizing these resources the best that they can. And I hope that these kind of resources really change the perspective for homeowners looking at their options and have an understanding. Because a lot of times people buy equipment just because they've been told it's the best system for them. And I can vouch that I have a brand new home that has a high efficient 14 seer air conditioner on it. I would say that, you know, Uncle Google has made the homeowner just as aware of what's going on in our industry as the, you know, the contractors and technicians are. That the information is out there, uh, easily typed into Google and you get a, a result like this. So the homeowner, I mean, contractors should expect a more informed homeowner when they go out to, to do a replacement. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope we're not used to. Yeah, no, we're not. And I, you know, there's a really good comment, comment slash question that just came in from Keith. Is there an industry certification that would allow a homeowner to know a specific individual or company is educated in the material that we're discussing? Also, would it be economically feasible to install ductwork allowing to meet the standards that we were talking about? Those new standards, Keith, are there because we were doing poor jobs to begin with. So all of the SEER 2 specifications that we see coming out on equipment, that is simply because the original standard was for a 0.1 inch static on our duct design. Never happens, does it? So the SEER 2 is just simply saying, okay, there's no such thing as 0.1 duct work out there. Let's re-rate all this equipment at a half of an inch of static, which is manageable, and then we'll see how well the system performs at a half of an inch versus the 0.1 inch that it originally was done for. So it was in response to poor duct work that we went from SEER to SEER 2 requirements. And as far as a national certification, I sure hope so someday. Um, <laughs> there I are really, a lot of industry certifications out there. There are. Um, not to toot our own horn, but here at ESCO, we do have a lot of certifications uh, in different areas, so, you know, specialty certifications, <clears throat> but uh, there are a lot out there. Yes. No standardized, and there may never be a standardized, um, but I hope that we see more certifications and more acceptance from the homeowners to be looking for certifications. Because, yeah, it could be specialized. Because if we have a technician that's really good on, say, a modulating gas furnace, are they any good at a inverter, heat pump, cold climate? I have Big somebody that can put it in a mini split, but do they know how to work on duct work? Right. Exactly. So, yeah, I see things get more specialized. When you take your vehicle to go get it worked on, there was a time when one mechanic worked on everything. Now you have mechanics for different components. You have emissions component, there are emissions technicians. You have drivetrain technicians. You have suspension technicians. You have controls and automation technicians. And I see that happening a lot more in our industry. It already does in the commercial and industrial side. Why wouldn't it in the residential? We're just simply tailoring our equipment a little bit differently because it's more advanced. So our technicians are gonna to have to be more versed. Are there gonna be technicians that want to learn all of it? Oh man, I hope so, that's what we're here for. So it's that tree, Clifton. Remember the tree is. with all the branches coming off? We have an HVAC tree and there's so many branches and each different branch represents a different area of the industry. I can't wait for you to scope that out and where people can see that a little bit clearer. Because if you think about you think about the HVAC tree from 30 years ago, it had a couple forks, right? It had residential, commercial, maybe chillers. And then you had a refrigeration because refrigerator, they just got everything dumped on them. That if it wasn't AC, it was just over here, right? <laughs> so as we have gotten further along in our technology, our tree, the HVAC and refrigeration tree has grown. And we are now more into the comfort level. We are going to have other branches of our tree that falls in our umbrella. What about a heat pump water heater? Who's supposed to work on that? Is that an HVAC? person that knows refrigeration cycles or is that a plumber who doesn't own a set of gauges and doesn't have a refrigeration license ah that's something to think about isn't it we're going to see these technologies coming into the residential sector and we're going to have specialized departments look at blower door testing that's now becoming code in many places around our country who's going to do that not the electrician not the plumber not the home inspector who would make sense to that? That's HVAC, that's ventilation. So our tree is definitely developing. 
And it's a good time to be in the industry because we have a support network unlike any other time in the past. Uh, when we were making transitions back in, in the 90s, you know, when we were doing like CFC transitions, we didn't have a lot of people coming to the industry going, hey, what do you need from us? In today's world, we have PNNLs, we have EPAs, we have DOE, we have manufacturers, we have a variety of different representatives of our industry all coming together to try to help us all be more prepared and make wise decisions and educate ourselves better. I think it's a beautiful place to be myself. All right, any questions? Let's get to the end here. Let's make sure we've got some resources too. So if anyone has any questions they want to bring in, remember, that's why we're here on Did You Know Show. This is a live opportunity. We're not all recording this, putting it together, and just throwing it out here for you to watch. Uh, we are all right here to answer questions for you. So if you have some, throw them in. And we want to make sure that you see some of the resources that we have. We've got the incentives at energy.gov. I spent a lot of time there. Uh, that whitehouse.gov, I've been using that resource a lot more here recently. They've been spending a lot of time explaining things, especially from the Inflation Reduction Act. It, so... Each one of these will add links into the videos at the end. I'll make sure that those are accessible to you. And uh, man, it's a, it's a lot of fun. I'm glad we had the opportunity to do this today. All right. Yeah, this is, this is a lot of fun. This is a lot of good information that I yeah. think people really need. Yeah, I do too. And I'm sure we'll have more questions. It's interesting because I've seen the counts of people grow as we progress through here. You've seen some dive off earlier and then must have came back and went, wait, 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 wait a minute. What did I just <laughs> hear? There's a lot of things that need to be digested a little bit differently. So we'll give it just another minute. If anyone has anything else that they would like to chat about, Jason, got any kind of questions you want to throw at Christian or Jamie? I'd like to thank them, one, for being here, no uh, and two, <laughs> uh, thank them for the resources that they're, they're, uh, they're providing here. This was awesome, beneficial, educational, everything I hoped it would be. Yeah, this is some good stuff. Glad, oh. glad to hear it, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And uh, we're going to wrap this up. And we will see you all next week on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show. Take care. Thank you for joining Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show. Brought to you by the ESCO Institute and in HVAC Excellence. Our mission is to bring the top educators of the industry here for you in a live, unique experience so that you can join us from multiple social platforms, all with the opportunity to ask questions, to be involved, and to learn about the things that are changing in our industry as they are changing. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notifications when we go live every week. Are you an educator looking for resources to be the best that you can be? Man, you're in the right place. And we invite you to come join us at the National HVACR Education Conference, where we bring all of these guests and many more, along with manufacturers and different organizations of the trade, so that we can all be in one place at one time and gather this information to make us better together. How do you learn more? Go to escogroup.org, select HVAC Excellence, and then the conference. I look forward to seeing you again next week on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show.